I'd like to introduce Professor Olin Dotson from Ball State. Professor Dotson recently supervised the development of the quality, quality of life analysis for the Star Historic District here in Richmond. Professor Dotson will speak on issues of neighborhood poverty and will engage in a conversation about fourth world theory. So please help me welcome Professor Dotson. Thank you. I hope the other sessions have been great. I wish I could be in them. Maybe after lunch I can meet some of the other um, participants. So I wanted to share some of my, some of my unpublished uh, writings that I've been developing. And they're influenced by um, a lot of my experiences, including my experiences in uh, Richmond here, particularly in the Star District. And it's actually influenced and further um, uh, cemented some of the positions that I'm developing. So I'll just share some of this, and then I'll talk a little bit about our assessment, and hopefully we can engage in some conversation. I declare that the United States of America is a fourth world nation. It has earned this distinction as a direct result of the manner in which it was established, how it developed, and the fact that it's demonstrably failed to confront its ever increasing disparity and unevenness. Disparity is not derived simply from a lack of opportunity or personal misfortune nor does it result in the common American dogma invariably linking failure to achieve to lack of effort. Disparity is a result of artificial and often stereotypical social constructions in sharp contrast to the eloquent yet hypocritical prose of the United States Constitution embraced by American exceptionalism to support a structure of empire. Disparity serves as a reinforcement for a metaphoric uneven foundation built on sand and subject to differential settlement. A nation founded under a legacy of genocidal, <coughs> racist, and sexist ordering systems, the United States is rendered helpless to exhibiting overwhelming evidence of multitudinous oppressive practices manifested through its blatant disparity. As Critical geographer David Harvey would describe a space of capital. Baltimore, the plantation that Harvey explored decades ago and the current violent, racially, socially, and economically stratified police state of the 21st century is not an anomaly in this fourth world nation. On the contrary, it is emblematic of the forces of capital that have shaped the city. Baltimore is America. Gary is the most American of all American cities. My adopted dystopia, Muncie, is still Middletown. Quote, a city having many features common to a wide group of communities, unquote. Richmond is a fourth world city and Detroit is a place and space to begin anew. On the surface, this fourth world nation can be observed with its socially constructed and economically stratified, physically and institutionally abandoned urban cores to massive, hastily manufactured and rapidly deteriorating old ring suburbs from post-World War II times, littered with vacant and undesirable shopping centers and parking lots to automobile-oriented, single-use zone, poorly constructed residential district to a seemingly, seemingly boundless array of depopulated small towns and rural spaces that vanish on the horizon of stolen land <clears throat> with a physical and social decomposition that was once a thriving agrarian society, at least for some. Upon further reflection and through critical geography, these troubling descriptive characteristics are merely a physical manifestation of the remnants of a failed capitalist experiment, a declining imperialist empire the United States of America is indeed a crime founded on conquest, genocide, and slavery, and on the brink of collapse 
under its own individualistic, violent, manipulative, and self-righteous structural system. The general reluctance of the people of the United States to meaningfully, openly, and honestly confront the ideologies behind disparity, including but not limited to the social constructions of race, place, gender and class undermines productive dialogue with respect to systemic patterns of sprawl, abandonment, the disappearance of work, and the resulting devastating social, economic, and ecological consequences. The con continued absence of reflection on the racialization of space, the physically stratified configuration of place, primitive and archaic ideas about gender, and the resulting unsustainable socioeconomic landscape threatens not only impoverished communities of color in northern Rust Belt cities, not only unproductive post-agrarian rural Midwestern uh, and southern spaces on deforested and poisoned land, sparsely populated by the downtrodden and heavily medicated, not only environmentally degraded post-mining, industrially abandoned Appalachian spaces occupied by the systemically undereducated and demoralized, not only the geographically isolated and dispirited survivors of eradication, pacified by mind-altering substances as the means to confront the reality of oppression in a fourth world nation, but the health and vitality of this entire country. So when my students came here this summer, and some of them were pretty shocked at uh, some of the um, environment they observed in, in uh, um, the Star District. I wasn't particularly shocked because I live in a fourth world nation. And so these conditions are widespread and pretty, pretty commonplace. As a post-developing fourth, fourth world nation, the primary challenge is for the United States to reimagine life as a means to heal humanity. A humanity that has been subjected to the ills of hatred, greed, and power for its entire existence. Out of desperation and absolute necessity, and by means of what Chris Hedges, someone you might want to look up, refers to as sublime madness, individuals and groups of individuals are emerging through grassroots organizations and movements focused on transformation, resilience, and survival. Richard Niebuhr wrote that those who defy these forces of injustice and repression are possessed by a sublime madness in the soul which disregards immediate appearances and emphasizes profound ultimate unities. He wrote that nothing but madness will do battle with malignant power and spiritual wickedness in high places. This sublime madness is understood as dangerous, but it's vital. And so from the trenches of fourth world spaces, there are individuals and organizations leading movements that reject the idea of wealth for wealth's sake and promote self-determination, self-reliance, and strengthening of community. Once liberated from the bondage and practices based solely on capital accumulation and the social construction of race, this fourth world nation can truly and earnestly begin to progress towards a more sustainable and equitable means of inhabiting the earth. Such movements are grounded in the understanding that the current social, economic, and political systems under which the United States operates has failed us. It's failed our colonial subjects, which we are all. So the report that uh, the students put together, um, sponsored by Richmond Columbia Properties and stakeholders from the greater Richmond um, community, for the Star District um, talks about the history, not only of the reports that have been done since this neighborhood was nominated in 1973 as a his to become a national uh, historic district, uh, but also the history of the entire city and how the city evolved. There's been a range of studies, and our study, um, um, instead of focusing just on the physical characteristics and the physical conditions of the district, it is critically important to document and analyze historic properties and attempt to preserve the rich 19th century architectural heritage 
and more specifically in the Star District. However, community social organization and other sociological concerns must be taken into consideration in order to formulate strategies towards enhancing the overall quality of life in the Star District and the greater Richmond community. Physical, social, and institutional neglect and abandonment negatively impact not only the neighborhood like Star District, but these cancerous societal issues undermine quality of life for the entire city of Richmond. Therefore, in addition to analyzing the physical conditions of the Star District, examining systems, organizations, and individuals established and committed to combating such ills is imperative. And that's been our objective. When I first, uh, <clears throat> uh, back in 2008, I took a group of students to several uh, post-developing cities in the Midwest. Um, I called it the Midwest Distress Tour. And one of the cities we went to was Youngstown, where I met a man named Hunter Morrison in Youngstown, Ohio. And this was 2008, it was during the presidential election period. Actually, it was October of 2008. And um, Hunter Morrison set us down and said, we are not coming back. Youngstown is not coming back. He said, McCain's been here, Hillary's been here, Obama's been here, and all they talk about is how we're gonna bring these industrial jobs back. They didn't even take the time to go out and look at the abandoned factories in the city and realize it would be like going to Muncie and talk about bringing General Motors back and the factory's not even there anymore. So what we have to do, he said, is focus on the quality of life for the 80,000 people that remain here. We gotta make Youngstown the best that Youngstown can be. And quality of life and quality of places is critical. Um, and we can't imagine that we're going to ever be what we were. We're going to be something else, something new, <coughs> something post-industrial. Uh, was a rapper in Detroit says something post-industrious to the most illustrious. Mm -hmm. He's talking about uh, that's uh, um, invincible in Detroit, uh, a city that we can learn a lot from. We can never imagine that we get to a place where we have. 70% absentee ownership, 30% vacancy, and, uh, and vacant lots galore. But that's what we have here, that's what we have there. In the case of Detroit, 113,000 vacant lots, if you can imagine that. There's more people that have left the city of Detroit than there are people in Indianapolis, in the metropolitan area of Indianapolis. You can imagine a city going from 1.9 million down to 690,000, that's everybody, in, man, woman, and child in, in, in Marion County leaving the city. That's how many people have left that place. And people have been without for so long that now they're engaged in the sublime madness that I refer to in, in trying to figure out new ways of inhabiting this earth. So I wanted to kind of open it up to questions, thoughts, concerns, wild accusations, uh, anything that we'd like to talk, chat about for Social fabric of the star neighborhood. Um, well, I think the most shocking thing was the um, was the degree of abandonment. Um, they they developed uh, maps um, that talked about some of the physical issues, uh, like the propensity for one way streets, uh, and how that actually is unfavorable in residential neighborhoods for a number of reasons. Uh, speeds tend to be higher on one-way streets, which can create issues for pedestrian safety. And of course, we don't have, uh, we have crumbling infrastructure and sidewalks throughout the district, so it's really not conducive to walking down the street on the sidewalk. Uh, you're walking oftentimes in the street, and uh, these sidewalks and alleyways, uh, also there's uh, institutional neglect um, as it relates to that. We also they also found that uh, the Star District's in the midst of a, a food desert, and they define what a food desert is and, uh, and how there's really no viable grocery store within a mile radius of the district. They talked about some of the assets, like some of the community and supportive services, and they made some, a series of recommendations. Um, 
based on best practices and using precedent from around the country. Um, they talked about the existing agencies and the range of agencies, the, in, uh, the infrastructure, the absentee landlordism, slumlords and the uh, presence in the district, vacant housing and uh, vacant land, and historic district uh, buildings falling in the district pair. So some of the recommendations included, but were not limited to, the creation of an advisory council specifically for the Star District, uh, comprised of a whole range of individuals, from individuals that might be seen as leaders to someone who might be a, a renter in one of these slum uh, lord-owned properties. <coughs> uh, networks of volunteers, exercising voice for addressing infrastructure improvements. The sociologists like Will, William Julius Wilson talk about exercising voice and exercising accent. Either when you're living in the inner city, um, either cities that have strong, neighborhoods that have strong community social organization have the capacity to exercise voice. They are the squeaky wheel, right? Creation of a second ward community development corporation. Uh, we learned in our presentation that there's a community, well, we knew about the community development corporation for downtown Richmond, but didn't realize that that uh, there, there was recent action to incorporate some of the larger um, areas um, outside of the Central Business District. But this Community uh, Development Corporation could be even not in competition with the other CDC, but to establish to address the physical and social needs of the original Northeast Quadrant or Second Ward of Richmond. Creation of a Community Land Bank Trust. I am fortunate enough to uh, go on a tour next week of land banks in Chicago, Flint, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Youngstown, and Pittsburgh, and how they all operate differently and how we can learn from that. Because land banks are kind of used as, as a tool to help uh, stop the slide as we continue to degradate. And introduction, uh, introduction of pocket parks within the Star District, establishment of a network of community gardens, on proposed pocket parks and or other shared spaces because we are amazed in what we're finding in cities like Detroit to Camden, New Jersey is that, um, and St. Louis is that these, these pocket parks and farms and, and gardens uh, bring people together in profound ways. Uh, people with different backgrounds and different experiences, different income levels, um, different ethnicities, whatever it may be. And, uh, I, I talk about the Sweet Potato Project and the Sunflower Project in St. Louis, all the way to the D-Town Farms in Detroit uh, and uh, all over the country. Detroit has over 1,300 of them now. Some of them are, are failing. Some of them are thriving. But people are trying to live in a new paradigm. So those were just some of the recommendations that our students had. Uh, as a result of a five-week study. Very, very uh, broad-based. Again, using best practices uh, as a means to uh, come up with these recommendations, not just pulling them out of the sky. Uh, some of you met the Bonner Center, uh, and uh, uh, James Teller is a friend of mine who's kind of restarted the Bonner Center uh, back in the 90s, and it's grown phenomenally phenomenally in an area of Indianapolis, the near east side, that's comparable to the Star District on a larger scale. Um, and the Bonner Center has done a tremendous job of providing resources, but more importantly, pooling resources that already existed and bringing them into that existing facility. So out of that conversation led their participation in this conference. And I'm, I'm proud and glad that they're here. And I wish I could be in that presentation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your, um description of the star neighborhood and what they found there seems to me could be uh, pretty typical of a lot of other cities. Uh, yes. You mentioned Youngstown in particular. I wonder if there's any place closer that might be a model. Well, um, I'd say even, even Dayton um, uh, could be a model. The near west side of Dayton and some of the challenges it face, faces could be a model. And it's interesting when you're talking about fourth world space, it doesn't really matter much how large the city is or small the city is. Uh, I've, come to, I've come to the conclusion that I can't really talk about just 
uh, large cities like Detroit and, and Cleveland and just talk about fourth world space within those communities. We could be talking about small post-agrarian towns like uh, um, uh, like Knightstown, for example, that you know, because farms are not what they used to be. Uh, we've kind of reverted to a system of sharecropping in this country that's, that's, uh, where, where uh, the people are leasing um, uh, the land and leasing these large combines and things, and the children are migrating to suburbia uh, as a means to survive because the farm farming system as it is doesn't require the degree of labor that it had back in the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the, and so you see crumbling uh, central business districts and, and towns and these little uh, um, consolidated schools where kids are standing out in the dark at 4 o'clock in the morning to go 22 miles to a school that they otherwise could have walked down the street to school or uh, gotten on their bike or something. It's just a different society. You know? and, and so we have to look at the United States as... When, when I talk about this fourth world thing, it's not necessarily, uh, um, I, I don't really care for the, the kind of um, um, hegemonic structures of first world, second world, third world. You know, those are the kind of structures that we created. Uh, politically correct terms might be developing. Well, if, if a third world country is a developing nation, then we are a post-developing nation. So that makes us fourth world. So I can't, I, I just, I'm, I'm looking at towns, cities, and even the decline of population when I mirror um, cities from <clears throat> Cairo, Illinois, to Camden, New Jersey, to Gary, to, to Youngstown, they're identical um, as far as the degree of, uh, East St. Louis, as far as the degree of abandonment. Richmond is not there but the Star District is as distressed as anything I've seen uh, in, in any of these cities. Uh, maybe not Detroit with 113,000 vacant lots, but still, statistically, it's pretty disturbing. And it's a beautiful inf infrastructure. It's a beautiful inventory of Queen Anne and, and uh, late Victorian and, and uh, early four-square homes and you know, the site where the Star School once stood. We like to talk about how the United States is slipping as far as the school education that we're providing our children, going from, you know, some suggest we're ranked 27th. I don't know where these rankings come from. Who we'll, we'll sit down in a room and rank these uh, national school district, but I think that we uh, still have some of the best uh, schools in the world. But we also have some of the worst schools in the world because of abandonment and stratification and disparity. So when you average that out, maybe that does put us at around 27. And I know as a product of both, someone who grew up in the Meridian Kessler of Indianapolis and because of my own circumstances ended up going to, uh, living in Brightwood. And, and the difference between the two really caused me to start asking questions about disparity as a small child. And you know we see it here, we see it everywhere, and and we also see um, the, uh, a neighborhood, a, a school defines a neighborhood. We need a school. Uh, it's a place. It's not only just for the education of the children, but it's a it's a place for people to come together. It's a place for PTA meetings. It's a place for people to exercise the voice that contributes to community social organization. And with the absence of that, albeit small or whatever, um, um, it, it undermines the fabric of the neighborhood. William Julius Wilson talks about community social organization and how you can live in a poor neighborhood that has strong community social organization and that community is healthier than a wealthier neighborhood that doesn't. But when we have all those institutions and, 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 and structures that contribute to community social organization missing, uh, then we're in trouble. And again, it doesn't only just affect the Star District, but it affects the entire community of Richmond and East Central Indiana. It's cancerous. Yes, please. Uh, so the school in the Star neighborhood, if I'm not mistaken, is a magnet school dedicated to free enterprise. 
Not anymore. Not anymore. No more. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no. It's kind of like those factories that Hillary and McCain were talking about. It's no longer there, but they kept the name star. Uh, my understanding, is they kept the name star as they moved. Is that right? It's yeah. always been Elizabeth Star, and we had a magnet entrepreneurial program that had to move out of one of the other buildings, and it moved to Star to try to attract folks, and it was diluted for lots of different reasons, mm -hmm. and so. That would be another interesting study as to how yeah, it I think that, that diluted. That's precisely what we have to do. We have to study that. Why did it fail? Why did it, uh, and, and talk, and speak candidly about it. You know, because when I talk about uh, this idea of fourth world conditions or living in a fourth world nation, I talk about it the same way we might talk about alcoholism. You know, AA, you know, the foundation and the 12 steps. The first step is to acknowledge that I'm an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic, to just say that. If we can't get past that first stage, then we can't begin to promote healing. You know, we can't even get past that first stage. And we are in denial. We are in denial, and that's why my students were shocked. They shouldn't have been shocked, because this is everywhere. Maybe they were shocked that it was a smaller town. I go to Rensselaer, I got a ticket for going 91 and a 65. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I, I was guilty. I, I wasn't profiled. I was guilty. Man. I was flying. And I got pulled over on 65. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to go to court because, you know, maybe maybe I can talk my way because it was aggravated. You know, maybe I can get it dis dismissed or something. You know, so I went to court in Rensselaer and I saw some of the, you know, some of the, you know, they had all kind of criminal activity. Um, and I was like at the end of it, so I was there all day. And people were coming out there. This, this I was. People were. This guy. This guy was sitting on a porch. He said, "Yeah, I was. Why, why were you sitting on the la lady's porch?" He said, "I don't know. I just saw a porch swing there, and I thought I'd sit on it. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> you got to. I mean, there was just all kind of people in that town. You know. I, I was like, man, Rensselaer is distressed, man. <laughs> and then finally, I'd been there since." It was 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.30, and it was about 4. And, and they said, the rest of you all can just go. And I was like, <laughs> I got away with it. I, I, I got away. I didn't, I, I, didn't I, I, I could still drive. I was able to drive here today because I don't have that ticket on my record. I don't have a suspended license or anything. That's a win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's widespread. It's widespread. And, Mm -hmm. And there were three people that just walked right out of here. Yeah. Just in total denial. Yeah. You know, that. Uh, yeah. We got we to gotta start engaging in dialogue, and we got to make sure that, that we don't have stratification and, 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 and disparity in those voices that are being heard. And I, I would recommend also, you know, maybe with an advisory council, that smaller meetings be organized. I've learned from experience that that when you do small meetings, uh, people have a tendency to exercise voice more. If it's a, if, you know, I, I did a revitalization in Hallville on the west side of Indianapolis, and we had over 119 meetings. Um, and we would have meetings in people's house, you know, maybe bring some cookies and just sit down and just talk about the challenges we're facing and, and, and what Miss Rudolph is doing, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, just at a small scale, because oftentimes in a large forum, people are reluctant to exercise voice. They're, they're scared to raise their hand because, you know, maybe someone might think the question is stupid or that I'm ignorant or that, that I just, or, or, or maybe I'm just shy. But, you know, and then you take those the small groups and then come together in a larger forum and, and people have kind of a vested interest. We want people to have a vested interest in their community. Even if I'm a renter and I'm renting from this so-called slumlord, you know, I'd like to have a voice. I'd like to say, yes, I'm running from a slum lord. He's a slum lord. Slumming. And uh, so, um, yeah, keep it, keep it small and intimate. And then when students that exercise, I mean students, what I'm saying, uh, communities that exercise voice, well, students that exercise voice, right? Yeah, yeah students exercise voice. That's how change occurs. That's, that's, right. that's where revolutions start. Oftentimes, it's on college campuses. Other thoughts? 
Yes, please. I think that, especially students that are engaged in, in majors that involve, well actually all majors um, uh, really are, are, are germane to the challenges that our city's facing and our towns are facing because, uh, and so I, I would try to figure out a way to, to link uh, activism to ac academic development. You know, I'm going to do a paper about uh, the life of Elizabeth Starr. You know, I, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a history major and I want to know uh, why is this thing called the Star District? And then when I start, the more questions I start asking, the, the scope of that thing expands. So I think, uh, and, and this is not, uh, I guess, a recommendation to students, but to institutions to try to figure out a way to use the academic work to be more engaged in the health and vitality of the community. This uh, issue with uh, Ball State taking over the Muncie Public Schools is extremely controversial and in some ways could be extremely revolutionary if, if Ball State goes beyond the teacher's college and expands it to everything from sociology to social work to architecture and planning to business to history and, and to, to really try to confront the challenges that have led to the decline of that school system um, uh, through um, the resources that it has. And uh, so Ivy Tech, uh, Indiana University, uh, Earlham, they all can contribute in that way. I think, can, I, can I just build off that? I think also we talk a lot here about workforce development and trying to figure out why you wouldn't stay, right? What, you know, why, why is that mindset that you're only going to be here for four years? What's, you came here for a reason. There was something that drew you here. Why won't you stay, right? I'm, I'm only here three years, but I've made the decision to stay because I can make an impact. So I think Lula and I have talked about that a little, right? What made you stay um, to fight for this, this area, right? We have tons of jobs available, and yet some of it is just that you may not be exposed to that, right? So why and how do we start to make those things link? Mm -hmm. So that's a discussion that the Chamber of Commerce, business and education section in particular, we're trying to have, right? Why? Why, how do we change that four-year mindset into you know, at least a 10-year mindset so you can help us move forward and, and regain population and right, what's missing? What are we missing? Yeah, one thing that I saw here that's unique as meeting um, young people and recent graduates that um, I'm not pointing to anybody or anything, excuse me, uh, <laughs> but, but that, you know, that are kind of, uh, that are activists, <laughs> activists in the community that are, in, I, I don't see that a lot. I don't see that a lot. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really refreshing. So I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I'm a pretty pessimistic person, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> I say, you look up Chris Hedges, he just came out with a book called America, uh, uh, The Farewell Tour. I mean, he's got me beat. He did, um, uh, he's, he's, he's gone, he's like, well, I'm done, you know? Um, but he still talks about sublime madness. And that's where I got that from. Because he's a Presbyterian minister that is out just, I mean, just, I would Google him, uh, look at him on YouTube. He wrote a book called Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. That's just profound. Um, yeah, the death of the liberal class. I mean, his, his books are, you know, some of them can be kind of conspiratorial, uh, but in general, uh, he's acknowledging, he's saying the things that we don't want to hear. Yeah. So some people will listen to my fourth world nation stuff and say he's, he's, he's really, he's, he's, Olin is depressing. Well, maybe so, but I do talk about hope. Because if I, if I don't, there's, there's really no reason to get up in the morning. I mean, why, why even get up? Why bother? Why not, you know, then you become nihilistic, uh, you know, you just, well, you know, you just, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's beyond saving. And we're not there. We're not there. This is worth fighting for. Yes. Speaking of a Presbyterian minister, mm -hmm. uh, what would you see to be the role of faith-based communities and faith-based um, organizations in a community like, a neighborhood like Star? 
I think it's all wonderful. I, I am not an advocate for any form of prostatizing. Um, I think as, if, if it's just uh, designed to, to help improve the, any, anything that helps to improve the quality of life of the citizens of this country and the recogn uh, uh, um, recognition that we're all citizens. Um, is, well, uh, some community development corporations are faith-based. Um, this whole idea of, uh, of, of uh, sublime madness was, was introduced by a theologian, Richard Cohn, the late Cohn, uh, I'm sorry, James Cohn. Uh, um, you know, so this idea of sublime madness and making a way out of no way uh, is, uh, is faith-based. Um, and of course, uh, even HUD I say even HUD, um, back in the uh, 90s when it was starting to expand this idea of, and definition of community development, um, um, engaged faith-based organizations uh, as nonprofits that could receive uh, low and moderate income housing tax credits and rental housing tax credits and historic tax credits and new market tax credits. You need some kind of vehicle to run these things so you can't just sit around and talk about tax credits unless you have a, an owner. Um, and so th there is ways to use faith-based organizations uh, to engage in public-private partnerships that don't violate our idea of separation of church and state. And we got really creative with that. I would, I would have to say that really started during the first uh, uh, being a, a, a um, someone on the left uh, during the first Bush administration under the leadership of the uh, late uh, Jack Kemp. Um, very, very creative. So we, we've engaged faith-based organizations even in uh, Hope Sixes that I did all over the country from Indianapolis to Springfield, Ohio, Decatur, Illinois. I mean Springfield, uh, Illinois, um, Chattanooga, Norfolk, Virginia. That is the foundation, particularly in the, historically in the black community. Those are our community centers. Those are our convention centers. That, you know, that's, that's, that's how those communities were able to, you know, the civil rights movement was, you know, founded in the church. So, other thoughts? Can you guys tell me a little bit? About since we, since we got a little time here and 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 we're still putting the food out, can you all tell me a little bit about some of the other sessions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, break me off a little bit. I want to hear how they, how they went. How was Bonner Center? Yeah, yeah. They got some challenges down there, huh? So uh, James Taylor, not the musician but the visionary behind the, the kind of the expansion of the Bounder Center because the Bounder Center predated him, but he, it, it pretty much died. And he, he was at uh, Indiana OIC State Council. And he came to me and asked me, hey, uh, I need an architect for this, for this vision that I have, and I wonder if you can help me. And I was pretty busy working on Hope Sixes at the time, and I was like, well, you know, I, I'll do what I can, but, you know, um, he said, I don't have any money, I don't have it. I was like, yeah, I don't either, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he showed me like a gas station, an abandoned gas station on the east side of Indiana. He said, I wanna, I wanna go here. I was like, really? You know? And uh, I, I was like, I, I, I'll do the best I can, man, but you might wanna talk to, and I made a record with Halstead, you know, cause he's got a little more resources. And so Halstead ended up doing all of it, you know, and uh, he came to me and said, man, I couldn't pay Halstead, but he stuck with me. And uh, uh, during the holidays, I came and brought him, uh, I think for New Year's, I brought him a bottle of champagne. And that's all I had. I didn't have any, he had some invoices that were outstanding, but I just brought him some champagne. And, he, <laughs> and that thing, is, I mean, he, that really set, I mean, he, he's doing community centers all over the state. Now, as a result of the success he had at the Bonner Center, and in the meantime, I'm, I'm just trying to get by, you know, with, with uh, you know, roughing it. The common thread that we've heard in everything, community development corporation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. how active and uh, what they can and can't do. And yeah. I mean that, and I don't know. I don't know. There isn't a question to that, or even a statement, except that mm -hmm. has become obvious in every one of the sessions that community development corporations can be a key to some of the restoration yeah. and revival that you're talking about. Yeah. Sometimes community develop. I've I've dealt with some community development uh, corporations that were disasters. You know, where you had executive directors that were philosophically opposed to what they were doing for a living, but they were in there because of nepotism or. Or you know, you know, I actually applied for a job when I graduated in real estate development from Columbia. I couldn't get a job in a community development corporation. I competed for one job and I lost out to an air traffic controller, you know, who had been laid off. You know, so a lot of times, you know, nepotism creeps in and all kind of stuff, and you have to watch that. Um, but there, there are community development corporations that are doing some wonderful work around this country. And often it depends on the, the the city, or the 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 way the city's structured. Um, sometimes they're not geographically specific, like okay, this is the community development corporation for the Star District. Sometimes they're based on a specific mission, uh, and and maybe it's a community development center that's dealing with after school care, uh, just for the city for the entire entire city of Richmond, for example. That's not. It's not, okay, yeah, we're just on the north side or a south side or west side or east side. Um, so it just depends on how they're organized. Indianapolis is pretty territorial, um, and they, I think we have about 19 CDCs, and, and you know, near north, Maple and Fall Creek, Martindale, Brightwood, Hallville, I mean, uh, uh, West Co., you know, and, and they have specific areas that they work with, but they're, they're all different. And those, uh, and those, that becomes uh, problematic sometimes because they're competing for the same resources. They're competing, they're all submitting applications to IFA for uh, tax credits, which are comprised of syndicators. Uh, syndicators like uh, Enterprise Foundation. And Enterprise Foundation has Enterprise Rose Fellows. And those are people in the design fields who well, enterprise is a syndicator, but they realize that in order for them to be effective, they have to have people on staff that have the vision um, consistent with the mission. It's just not about just dollars and cents. So they place these enterprise roles fellows all over the city. So one idea would be, I mean, all over the country, um, to try to see if we can get an enterprise roles fellow to come to, uh, to, to uh, Richmond. So I would look up enterprise roles fellowships or there might be some people that are interested in becoming an Enterprise Rose Fellow. I met a woman working in rural Mississippi uh, that did some amazing work with uh, Enterprise Rose out there in um, Greenwood, Mississippi. Yeah. There was an article we saw a while back, I can't remember where it was posted, but it was talking about how Richmond was the number one or the top five most affordable town in like 50,000 and below and they took into account affordability with rent, um, housing costs, income. I did, have you seen any articles similar to that, or is there Was that the one about retirement? That it was the best place, one of the top five places to retire? It wasn't retired. Retired. it was about most well, affordable living. Yeah, the EDC, my office does a cost of living collection every quarter, and so I have a staff member that goes out and checks housing prices, rent prices, there's a list of items that she has to go to five different stores to collect the cost of those, calling barber shops and all different other service providers, and that information is turned in to a national organization where it's okay. then calculated and then we'll rank accordingly. So yeah, we consistently rank third, fourth, or fifth in the nation as the lowest cost city. And I think that um, somehow some of these things can't be calculated, but quality of life has to be a factor in that as well. And I think that somehow that is taken into consideration as well, that it also has a pretty good quality of life. Yeah, one of the um, statistics is that we have the lowest cost for yoga classes in the nation. <laughs> <laughs> hey. so I can testify, I mean, that's in the nation. But we, we've been gone for 20 years. Uh -huh. We were some of those people who in the 90s says, there's nothing here in Richmond. You exercise exit. Yes. The exercise and voice, exercise voice. We got a position with a major corporation in Atlanta and we said, see you, we're never coming back. In October of 2015, we had the opportunity to look at a historic home in Richmond 
and we gave up the very comfortable, very high quality of life in a master plan community in Florida to move back to Richmond. Much to the dismay of our longtime friends and our family who live here mm -hmm. and have never moved away. I think the other thing that happens is, um, particularly because there's this idea, and I'm sure EDC probably thinks about this idea of residual land value, which is also, that's kind of like quality of life, one of those things that's difficult to calculate. Um, and we almost have to come with a mindset that I am not buying this house, this historic house as an investment. I'm buying it because I want to enhance my quality of life in, 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 um, in an interesting way. We live in the residence. People tell us you know, they didn't think that it was a residence, but we live there. Mm -hmm. Husband, wife, three kids, two dogs, and a cat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I, can't, I can't look at my, um, my house in Muncie in uh, the old West End as, a, as a, an investment. If I do, I'd, I'd, be, I'd probably collapse before you today. <laughs> You know, it, it's just, uh, and so I just have to, and, and there's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about living in Middletown, um, you know, and I just have to accept this reality and, and uh, make the best of it and engage in this idea of sublime madness, yeah, which means, you know, I got to be a little crazy. You know, you got sublime madness, you're a little crazy, oh, yes, and that's a good thing. <laughs> It's a good thing because it's ground. It's ground in faith. I'm not here to talk about faith based, but it's ground in faith. This idea of sublime madness. Yeah. So you got to. We all got to be a little crazy, right? Any more crazy folks? Well, I think uh, I think what we should do is take advantage of the fact that we're in the room where the food's being served, and eat it all up, and then they they just got to work it out. They just got to work it out. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh.